Well, good afternoon. We're going to change moderators as well as speakers. So I am Rob Myers with the USDA Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program. I'm based here in Columbia, Missouri at the university and I'll serve as the moderator for our last few presentations. We do have a slight change in our program. Uh, Amy Alish, who was scheduled to talk about uh, pollinators for cucurbits, was not able to make it. So fortunately, we have another excellent speaker. Uh, Nadia Navarrete Tindall is going to speak about native pollinators a little more generally, not specifically on cucurbits, uh, but she's got a lot of experience with native plants and uh, the insects that that pollinate some of our plants in Missouri. So, Nadia? Hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm gonna try to fit in the presentation that was supposed to be instead of this one. But I think you will find it interesting. I'm sure that uh, if you hear the presentation, the main speaker in the morning, it's all related, we are all related, where everything is in integrated, and then I don't separate a, a native bee from a honeybee and native plants and even some of the non-native species that sometimes can be uh, good for pollinators. Well, my presentation will be uh, mainly about um, who the pollinators are, and um, I'll briefly talk about the difference between bees and other pollinators and how they pollinate and some of the threats to pollinators, their habitat needs, and how to protect them. And if we have time, I will uh, cover some of the native plants that are good for pollinators. If, you, if we don't, because it's really, the time is very short, I have uh, handouts. For you, I don't think I have enough for everyone because I just hear about this doing this presentation yesterday in the afternoon. So I didn't have time to print too many things. But if, it, if you want any of these um, handouts, please sign your name and I'll be happy to send it by email. We have a um, page in the back. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a, the accent is from El Salvador. It's why I sound funny. And if you don't understand me, please let me know because I'd be happy to repeat. So the first thing is I want to um, mention is who the pollinators are. I'm sure everybody here knows at least most of them. We have a uh, from native bees to wasps, flies, butterflies and moths and beetles, and even the occasional hummingbird. Native bees are more efficient than any other pollinator, including honeybees. But sometimes we confuse them. They, we, sometimes the uh, flies might look like bees, but one way to separate them is that flies have two wings and bees have four wings. It's one characteristic. Another thing that was, is why bees are more uh, effective pollinators is because, because they have pollen sacs in their legs and they have fuzzy bodies. You can read there, this sounds funny. Um, but uh, so what happens is that the pollen, they are able to carry pollen in their body too. In case of flies, they might have some hairs but they, the pollen doesn't stick as easy as on, as on bees in general. Bee pollination is very effective on apples, sunflowers, like even white roses, alfalfa, and other legumes, orchids and pentstemons, just as a few examples. Beetles require, or well, mainly because their bodies, they are kind of clumsy insects, so they look for very open flowers. Like in this case, you're looking at a wild rose, and they like, um, well, they like lots of, they eat the pollen, but can also feed on the flower. So they are, they happen to be pollinators because they like the flowers. And uh, you can find them in magnolias, for example, in lotus flowers, day lilies, and any other uh, plant in the rose family, family like wild plum. Fly pollination, 
as I mentioned before, they do consume pollen, the flies. They can eat the flower, but they don't necessarily look for nectar. So they, and also another characteristic uh, of flies is that they like flowers that have a strong uh, odor. And one example is the Aristolochias. It's like Dutchman pipe. It's one a native plant. And they also like uh, flowers that have brown colors. Butterflies are attracted to, ver to plants, to flowers that produce lots of nectar, like, the one, like plants in the sunflower family. And hummingbirds look for a uh, Flowers that have a, they, they, are, they are tubular, like this pickerel weed. We have all here about the problems that honeybees are facing. At this point, I'm sure many of you, how many doesn't know what's happening with honeybees? So haven't heard anything about honeybees. Everybody knows about it. So. When we have, you probably have seen that there are honeybees in, uh, like in the wild that are still around there. And we can see that in our gardens. At Lincoln University, we have um, created some native plant outdoor laboratories. In different, we have a diversity of flowers. And we see the honeybees coming to us all the time. Right now, it's a very healthy looking a population of honeybees in our gardens. We have a, the asters are the ones that are blooming, even with this uh, funny weather, it's still warm. So they are pretty uh, abundant. One uh, interesting fact about native bees is that they are most diverse and uh, they're abundant, more abundant pollinators. We have about 4,400, more than 4,400 species of native bees in the states, including uh, 45 species of bumblebees, and many are found in Missouri. We have about 400 and counting. The research has been increased recently after the problems with honeybees, so we are learning more and more uh, about native bees. It's very important to know that native bees uh, nest, or at least most of the native bees nest in the ground, and others make tunnels in stems or hollow stems or structures. Most are solitary. However, many are social, like bumblebees and sweat bees, but most are solitary. So we need to be sure that we are providing habitat for all of them because they are so diverse. They're very tiny to very robust. From one that is called perdita, perdita in Spanish was close. It, it means lost, like perdida, because it's so tiny, it's very hard to see. And uh, we have the large ones as carpenter bees. They are even them being so large are pollinators. In some, of you have, some of you might have seen this poster that has a different kinds of uh, native bees. It has been put together by a, by a series of agencies. It's actually available from the Forest Service. And is, you can see well, it's hard to see from the back, but you can see the diversity. See the big size and shapes. Even the sweat bees that sometimes we don't like are very good pollinators. Well, we are annoyed by them, but when we re if you remember that they are pollinators, then you'll be happy that they are around you. And then we, here is one of the sweat bees and it's actually a bumblebee that you are seeing here. This is in my backyard. I live in Colombia, in the middle of the city, and, but we have a native plant garden in the, in the front yard and backyard. We provide all kinds of habitat as, as much as we can, and of course, in, 
being sure that I, we please the neighbors. But they have, neighbors have, been, have become a little bit more um, appreciative of what we have through the years. We had problems before. Well, like they called the city, for example, one time. And then some of them, uh, even our neighbor, didn't like the way he was seeing. But now he's, well, they probably got used to us, <laughs> mainly. <laughs> so another thing that I like to point out, what is a, like comparing native bees versus honeybees, is that native bees can be more efficient to pollinate fruits and crops uh, fewer native bees are required per acre, and it depends on the species, of course, and I will mention some examples later on. Native bees also forage earlier in the day, um, and also later and, and, later and a earlier in the day than honeybees. And they visit flowers even during wet and cold conditions, and they don't need maintenance. They don't need hives unless you provide your own artificial nesting, then you have to clean them, but it's very minor. So everybody knows about the, the importance of pollinators. Just to point out, fruit and seed production depends on pollinators. 70 to 80% of flowering plants depend on pollinators to produce fruits and seed. And uh, first, I, I had my number 70, but I was reading an article yesterday where they are talking about being 120 crops. Main crops depend on pollinators, na on native bees. And pollinators can also be the source of food for other wildlife. So let's think about the integration. We are, it's a, it la it's a life cycle. For example, native bees can be food for a quail, for those of those that are interested in raising quail. So in, in general terms, we're maintaining diversity in ecosystems with their presence. Some uh, commercial crops that depend on honeybees and native bees are all the berries that I could think of. Passion fruit, that's a native passion fruit that grows in Missouri, um, gooseberry, and of course, cherries, plums, and almonds. These are some of the fruits that I mentioned. And the cucurbits are really uh, depending on native bees for pollination, as well as vegetables. And you probably have here that tomatoes, even though they can be uh, pollinated by air, by the wind, by the presence of pollinators, production increases. And the same thing with, with cucurbits, they do need native bees. And I found this information in, in, the, in a website. This was just, um, I thought it was pretty appropriate for the presentation. This is a study done by the Circe's Society. And I uh, wanna uh, show you this, this book. If you haven't seen it yet, it is really very, very, very important book and it gives you all kinds of information from native bees, native, pollin nat native pollinators in general, and shows you what to do pro to, protect, to protect them. So, and there are other things like this handout that is very, very easy to follow. It just gives you very simple information. Easy to follow. So what I found in this, during this study is that they, they actually found that there were 23 species of native bees that were um, visiting watermelon. But these, were, uh, five, the, these five were the most common, and that includes two bumblebees, a squash, bees, a squash bee that is actually depending on cucurbits, and longhorn bees as well as sweat bees. So diversity was their key for a um, good production. They found that pollination by bees was very critical for the watermelon crop. And even though the European honeybee was often is very effective, and in this case they're giving exact uh, numbers, two hives per acre. 
Native bees are, were also very significant pollinators, and they show that one, uh, in one county in California, native bees provided all the pollination needed. Probably honeybees were not, were not present. And what I mentioned before, that on a bee per bee basis, they are more effective than honeybees. And they forage, like before, I may, I'm repeating some of that, but I think it's important that they forage earlier in the day and transfer the pollen more efficiently than they introduce honeybee. And they might, in the right situation, if you are providing habitat and all the appropriate um, nesting grounds, you might have a healthy population of native bees. And this is just fun for me to show you because I mentioned that we have native plants at Lincoln University. We planted this watermelon in the middle of the native plant garden. And it was, this watermelon was the sweetest I ever had. And it was full of seeds, so that tells me that it was, there were lots of pollinators. And we did it again this year. And these are some of the vegetables that depend on native bees for seed production. Even though some, you don't need the native pollinators to produce them, but you need the seed for propagation. And I have a few fruit trees. Of course, it's my specialty is native plants, so you might you you see the influence. I like to show all the native plants, and like papa is one a native fruit that depends actually on flies for pollination, and that fruit is becoming more popular. We have others like persimmon. They do depend on native bees. Those specific. Uh, types of native bees, and what plums do depend on native bees for pollination. They are visited by honeybees too. I'd like to mention this because um, their bees are threatened, not only honeybees. Bees, other beneficial insects, are threatened by all these uh, situations, very maybe extensive agricultural practices, with, if you attended the presentation in the morning, just remember before you do something in your farm that would affect the rest of your farm or the ones next to you. So we have development, development land fragmentation. It's hard to do things, uh, hard to go against it. It's happening. Light pollution keeps happening, and that brings introduced species, diseases, climate stabilization, and, but we can do something about this, and I will mention that. And this is the idea and bring. This is another book that is pretty popular at this moment, and I'm hoping. How many of you are familiar with this? Uh, bringing nature home. Nobody knows it. I'll be happy to. I'll put it in the back if you would like to look at it, and I can talk about it. We actually brought a. Uh, the, the author of this book at Lincoln University, we had about 300 people. It would be happy to bring him again because it's very inspirational. And that um, he's more focused on the problems that uh, beneficial insects are having in urban areas, or in semi-urban areas. Okay, pesticides. I wanna mention this because this is a fact that came from that book, from the Cersei Society, this one. It's true that there are more pesticides present in urban streams than in rural areas. And the reason for that is that we have, a, there are more regulations in rural agriculture operations than in urban areas. We have a little, a little lawn that is uh, bombarded with more pesticides than the average field in rural areas. So a solution could be to look for alternative and less damaging, damaging herbicides, insecticides, and other chemicals. And I'm sure we have here uh, some of you that are already doing organic farming, so you are doing your part already. Do you have any questions so far? In how much time do we have? Five minutes? 
Okay, and I just want to mention briefly about some of the things that we can do to protect habitat. Um, initially, is first you have to identify habitat that is already present in your farm. You might leave a swale that where you cannot grow anything alone. Try not to mow too much, or if you um, just leave an area alone, and that you'll be providing habitat. And, and think about the biodiversity. Sometimes we don't think about the butterflies that they they do need uh, host plants for their caterpillars. Like an, an example, very specific example is a spice bush. There is a swallowtail that depend on spice bush for their caterpillar to grow. And there are many other examples. And diversify, add wildflowers, grasses, woody plants, and, wood, and also blooming plants that are available throughout the year. The reason for that is that some of the bumblebees have not only one, but up to three roots throughout the year. So they need the wildflowers for, uh, for food. So you can think about it. And also, I mentioned already about providing nesting sites. Leave areas alone. You don't have to uh, crop everything. Just leave areas uh, bare that are good for ground nesting bees. And let me see if I can find some more. And do some plant planting groupings. It's another easy way to do it. And add shrubs and... Um, to provide cover, not only for your insects, for your native bees, but also create gardens that even include grasses. They provide cover and protection for your native bees. And if you have a, a piece of land where you are trying to provide habitat for quail, like with brush piles, you're already providing habitat to your wild bees. Water sources, of course, are very important. And let me just skip this. This is one example of artificial nests for, for bees. And simple things are leaving debris, leaving leaves that will provide habitat for your insects. In protection, especially in winter time, don't clean too much. Just leave it alone, and leave all the debris in in the in clean in the spring. <coughs> so be sure you have flowering plants during the growing season, and during the spring flower during the spring, you can provide flowers. Uh, from trees, shrubs, and woodland forbs. And also in the summer, there are so many plants, that especially those that grow naturally in prairies or savannas that require full sun. And in the fall, you have the golden rods, the asters, and even some very special plants like close gentians. This particular plant that you are seeing here depends entirely on a, a bumblebee Bumblebees, if you see, if this is the shape of the plant. It's closed gentian or blue gentian. The bumblebee comes on top and gets in there. It's similar to the, to the flowers of blueberries. They're kind of, they have their, their like cup. So the bumblebees get in and pollination occurs. So are we, we have two minutes. And I'll just show you some pretty plants of native plants that can be Okay, you can establish your pollinators. Here's your wild plum. I say make, a, make a, I mean, I keep looking for the wild plum jams because for me it's the best, but I don't find it very often. Maybe you can think about it if you have it in your yard or in your farm. Service Berry provides a blooming early in the year as well as nine bark. This is a very um, special plant, sun flux. It's actually blooming right now, will be blooming through the winter, and you still see it early in the spring. And we have it at Lincoln if you wanna come and see it. And since like Columbine, we don't think too much about them because they're so common, 
but they can uh, they attract the bumblebees in the spring and but in hummingbirds prefer these plants to the food that we put in the bird feeders another good plant is this legume is Baptisia blue Baptisia or a wild indigo bumblebees just love them and if you see in the back uh, this is a white uh, Baptisia this is in, in my in my uh, by the curb in my front yard so in the spring is very pretty and if you are in the I live on Grand Lane so you ever see you will probably be able to see who we are I don't think that anybody else has native plants in the in the in that area. And we have a um, rose verbena, is very popular also for native bees. Blooms in the spring. And this is the I mentioned false wild indigo. This has been promoted for quail habitat. And but this plant in the spring, like early summer. May, June, is so loaded with, bad, with little bees, tiny bees, all kinds of insects that you want to have it in your yard. So I'm going to stop with this. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Well, we have about four or five minutes for questions. Um, we, we read something online uh, a couple weeks ago about that some of the native bees will actually attack our honeybees, um, like uh, the yellow jacket. Do you know anything about that? Yellow jacket is, is not, if I say right, it's a wasp. Uh -huh. It might be, because they also attack humans sometimes, if you are close to their, their nesting. But I would, some other people have asked me if honeybees attack native bees. So it's, I'm sure that there is, a, it has to do with competing with a habitat. So you pro, if you provide all kinds of flowers and all kinds of uh, protection and cover, and I, I expect that you won't have those problems. It's like creating a whole a condo for different species. Any other question? Mm -hmm. uh, on the predators of bees, um, this orange and black ant, very large, and they call it a cow killer, a cow killer ant. And it, does it kill native bees? I know, I don't know the answer. Hmm? I'm sorry, uh, he's talking about a, a type of ant. In, how do you call it? I think it's native, it's a uh, common name, is cow killer. It's supposed to have a very bad bite. Cow killer ant. It's very large and it's orange and black and furry. Mm -hmm. I've been told that it finds ground nesting bees and preys on them. So you wonder if they are attack I native bees? I on my farm all the time and I don't know if I'm supposed to be killing them. My I mean, I try to eat them and they usually do, but I, I've read and been told that they kill native bees. I, I, didn't know if you had heard of I don't know. I don't know the answer for that. Uh, and if somebody asks me what if you should kill something, maybe uh, me, I'm the ra I'm the wrong person to ask that question, because I really like to leave everything in the farm as possible, because then you have diversity. Maybe somebody will come and eat your ant. Yes, but I'll try to find out the, the truth. I'm not an entomologist. I'm learning at, as you do, and I, I read a lot of books. And but it's interesting to hear about those questions because I, I never thought about it. But just think about diversity. The more diverse you are, do, there will be someone that would eat the next one, the largest insect. Mm -hmm. Is there an artificial structure, artificial uh, native the, uh, uh, structure that, that would attract mo the most bees? Or Yeah, he's talking about uh, artificial nesting. I briefly show you a couple samples. And those are for a very specific type of bees, especially the ones that, uh, that nest in tunnels. 
So you would have to, I didn't show you some that are good for ground nesting bees. So there are different kinds. And actually this booklet, if you're, hap you're welcome to see it, uh, you see some examples as well as in this book. So yeah, it, you can create, you can provide habitat, artificial habitat for different kinds of bees. Thank you.